subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update. Join the only official Telegram channel of Rao's IA Study Circle to get relevant material and important updates. Hello everyone and welcome to Daily News Simplified, your one-stop solution to detailed analysis of current affairs which are published in the Delhi edition of Hindu newspaper. Articles dated 19th of November 2021 are listed on your screen and the time stamping for these articles is already given in the description box. So let us begin with the first article for the day. The first article for today's DNS was published on page 8th of Delhi edition Hindu newspaper. Under this article, the writer has suggested that there should be a collaborative effort on the part of center as well as state when it comes to spending or the public spending or the public expenditure in the country. The context of the article says that central government has recently released over 95,000 crore rupees to the state. And this shows that there is a stimulating alliance which is being developing up to show a better functioning of the fiscal federalism in the country. The relevance of this article comes from the fact that from the prelim examination, questions could be asked related to the revenue trends in India, tax related revenues, tax compositions and even the revenue sharing. In the mains examination, questions could be put up related to the aspects of economic growth and development. And this is asked in the general studies paper 3. For today's discussion, the content of this article would include the detailed analysis of this article, the role of public expenditure in developing economy like India, the status of public expenditure in India and here we will discuss major data sets from economic survey and the budget. We will also look into some of the issues faced by the government both at the center and the state while going for the public expenditure and what are the negative impacts of high public expenditure in a country. And lastly, we will look into some of the possible solutions to bring back the public expenditure in the country but do not impact the economy in a negative terms. So let us start with simplifying the article first. Now what has actually happened? Center previously was reluctant to share the revenues which was generating with its own consolidated fund of India. And even on the GST that is goods and service tax composition, it was reluctant to share the composition with that of the states. Then what happened? This reluctance led to the anguish between this reluctance led to the anguish among the states in India which ultimately led to the central going for the releasing of these funds recently. Now, why government has released this fund? The point is that releasing of this fund will bring the economic recovery at the state level. These funds will be utilized by the state government to raise the capital expenditure in the country. And this capital expenditure will boost the gross capital formation and ultimately the gross value added. Previously, government was thinking that if they release these kind of funds, they will lose out on the important revenue generated in the last two years. But as a result of this release, finance ministry at the center has clearly and explicitly commented there will be no impact on the cuts in the excise duty which they have conducted recently. And these cuts will not reduce the revenue of the government. They will not be compelled to restrict the future flow of such funds. Now, why central government is commenting that despite the cut in the excise duty, there is no revenue loss. The reason being that there is a rise in the demand in the economy. So if government has reduced the excise duty, let's say on the petrol, because of the rising demand of the petrol and the diesel in the country, government can still get the revenue it has already targeted. So this was the basic crux of this article. So with this, now I will leave you with this important classification of the government budget, including the receipts, because as of now, we are focusing on the receipts and the expenditures. So these are the two basic classification. You can pause the video right now and you can go through this basic classification. Let us now move to the role of public expenditure in a developing country like India. Well, India is a nation where money matters a lot and this money, if coming from the government side, can develop or can bring the following benefits. 
The first one is the socio-economic overheads. There are certain sectors in the economy where the private sector is not ready to bring investment. The most important one being the education in the rural sector. So in that manner, government expenditure is very crucial. This expenditure also helps in the exploitation and the development of the mineral resources. Because there are certain mineral resources in the country, every country for instance, that are to be exploited at a very high cost. And at this point of time, expenditure coming from the government side plays a very important role. This was seen during the 1950s, 60s and 70s when it comes to the mineral resources such as coal or petroleum oil. Next one is balanced regional growth. In order to reduce the disparity between different states as well as the disparity between center and the states, a public expenditure is one of the best solution a developing country can have. Then we have the development of agriculture and the industry. This is important because agriculture is the largest employer in the rural sector and industry along with the service sector is the largest employer in the urban areas. Hence, public expenditure can target both these areas simultaneously. The requirement of physical infrastructure is like a catalyst to the economic development and government can play a major role in developing infrastructure. Because if roads are not constructed by the public sector, there is no one to develop the roads in the country. Even if the private sector is developing the infrastructure such as roads and highways as of now, it is because of the demand created by the public met by the government. Public expenditure can also help in human capital formation, that is education, health, infrastructure and others. They also help in creating the social infrastructure which includes your education, health and related other concepts. And lastly, public expenditure is important for providing subsidies and grants. These subsidies and grants help in the sectors like agriculture, industry, services and especially the micro, small and medium enterprises to grow and sustain in the hardship economic situation. Going by the current trend or the current status of the public expenditure, we have this following data set and arguments. Government has spent 13% higher than the budget estimate in 2021 already. This shows that there is a rise in the public expenditure to a very higher extent. On the other hand, the receipts which government is receiving right now is 29% lower than the budget estimate. So assume this, in previous year government was at zero, hypothetically. They have increased by 13% on the spendings and they have reduced by 29% on their revenues. This has created a gap of 42% to the GDP which is a matter of concern. However, as of now, the real concern is the economic recovery. The nominal GDP was expected to grow at 14.4% according to the Ministry of Finance. However, this is likely to be because of the higher inflationary pressure which the country is facing right now. Fiscal deficit target was 6.8% in 21-22, down from what it was in 2021, that is 9.5%. This is a very promising sign as of now because this shows that India is on the path of recovery. The government has not changed the income tax rates for the individual as well as the corporations. Why? In order to boost the demand. Government has also provided a tax deductions up to 1.5 lakh to different demands of financial sectors in the economy. This will also boost the industrial setup. And lastly, the sluggish export growth in the first few quarters and the sudden rise in the oil and the gold imports has increased the current account deficit which has impacted the budget allocation. So all these points has clearly shown that there are certain limitations in the current status of public expenditure in the country. And this is one of the reasons why government, the central government, was reelected in order to provide funds to the states. Now what are the issues with the public expenditure? Can we say that government in India can spend n number of funds or they can spend infinite amount of money? The answer is no. There are certain limitations which are attached to the public expenditure in the country. Because of these expenditure, government is reluctant to invest in the unlimited manner. These constraints include that when government spends too much money in the economy, they raises the rate of interest. 
because the money which government is spending is coming from the borrowing from the buyers higher borrowings from the citizens means government is going to pay higher rate of interest and that will increase the rate of interest and higher rate of interest will automatically crowd out or remove the private investment from the country because private investors are not interested to take money at higher rate of interest when government spend too much of money it create a substitution effect between leisure and work people take more time to leisure and less time to work which reduces the productivity in the country when the public expenditure is uncontrollable it creates a tough balance between social and economic benefits so government has to decide whether they have to focus more on the social infrastructure or the economic and the physical infrastructure and until and unless this balance is not met public expenditure remains futile next is that public expenditure is not for profit the basic purpose of public expenditure is to create demand in the economy protect or recover the economy from slums or from the depression and provide employment to the public they are not at all involved in the production of the competitive activities and last limitation of public expenditure is that it reduces the government ability to work on other sectors such as industrial sector so if government is spending more on the social sector such as health and education which the government for instance have been doing in the past one year due to pandemic crisis the funds which were available to the industrial sector has reduced considerably and given these kind of issues which we are facing right now in the country related to the public expenditure let us look into what solutions do we have the solution includes that government should create a public spending council in order to regulate the spending limits of the government both at center and the state the second one is removing the red tapism at universal rate once red tapism is removed it will attract the private investment irrespective of the interest rate and even when the interest rates are very high given these kind of incentives private sector would be in a position to spend more or invest more in india green clearances for different projects including the infrastructure projects should be given more in the hands of the states rather than center in order to decentralize these kind of clearances all the states irrespective of their economic size and development level should go for universalizing the single window clearances for attracting the private investment see these steps are required in order to reduce the public dependence on the investment and raise the private investment both center and the state should focus on cooperative as well as the competitive federalism to boost the output and the productivity of their respective economic areas we also require interministerial coordination between the central ministries in order to produce more output per cost which they are investing in different projects bottom up approach is one of the other area where we can look up because under this approach we'll start from urban local bodies and the panchayati raj institution to boost the economic activities we can also create regional investment facilitation center in order to attract not only the individual investors from the country itself but also the institutional investors from outside the nation and lastly we should also focus more on the infrastructure growth because this create two important aspects first being the employment in the country and second it creates the dynamo effect or the multiplier effect to boost the economy further so given all these kind of initiative if taken into practice india will be able to restrict its public spending and can attract the private investors more for the economic recovery with this discussion place now i will leave you with this important practice question so read this question carefully and try to answer it under 250 words in this question you have to start with defining or explaining the current situation of the fiscal federalism in the country and explain at least four to five points on which why there is a lack of coordination between center and the state on fiscal federalism the next five six points should be the measures that should be taken up to improve the fiscal spending from the government side and conclude with important data set scheme or any recent initiative taken up by the government of india with this discussion in place let us now move to the next article for the day this article was published on page 8th of delhi edition hindu newspaper and talks about the recent initiative taken by the government of tamil nadu 
where a new draft policy was passed on the resettlement and the rehabilitation of people who are from the poor background and living in the urban areas of Tamil Nadu. The writer has claimed that this policy had certain limitations and certain benefits which can help in resettlement of poor people. However, from the perspective of the UPSC, we will not venture into the initiative or a detailed analysis of initiative taken by the state government. But we will take some of the important pointers from this article in order to create content for a journal studies paper 1 where the slavers ask about the issues related to the urbanization and the population. So, based on that, the content for this discussion would be the issues with the resettlement of slums or the illegal settlement and the solutions for ease of settlement or resettlement of these peoples who are poor or the urban poors. So, let us start with the basic issues faced by the authorities while rehabilitating the slum population. The first issue is that resettlement is very limited and haphazard. Limited in the sense that there are not many cities in the country where this resettlement of the urban poor takes place. And even if there are certain cities where this rehabilitation is taking place, it is in a haphazard manner. They are mostly rehabilitated at least 40 to 50 kilometers away from the urban areas or the economic activities. The rehabilitation area often faces the issue of alcohol and the substance abuse. They are not treated in a humanly manner. Most of them are perceived to be the criminals or socially backwards. Criminalization rate and the rate of crime is very high in these areas. They are forced to resettle. Like one of the examples which was mentioned in the article says that there were certain people who were living for about 200 years or more in a particular area in Tamil Nadu. And they were forced to leave that place and move to the other area where the basic amenities were not as per the demand of the human requirements. The other issue is that most of the cities do not have rented accommodation for the urban poor. These urban poors are either not documented or even when they are documented, they are not documented from the perspective of being a settler in the slum areas. Most of the states either do not have or even have the migration policy, it is very weak in terms of the requirement of the 21st century. All these issues have led to the emergence of ghettos across the towns, which are shanty colonies with underdevelopment of all the human basic needs. And lastly, all these reasons have led to the lack of employment opportunities being provided or being available to these urban poor in the slum areas. And based on all these studies and researches, it shows that slum area is nothing but a vicious cycle of economic poverty, where a person who enters the slum area as a poor will remain poor and will die poor. And because of this, we require the following initiative to be taken as early as possible. We require national slum rehabilitation policy, and this should be followed by the slum rehabilitation policy by each and every state where urban population is over 25%. Then we require rental units for temporary stay to the urban poor, especially the migrant laborers. Every municipal body should have anti-encroachment drives every month in order to remove these kind of settlements before they get very densely populated. Long-term planning that is far-sighted policy, a plan which covers at least 35 to 50 years in the future should be developed at the municipal level. This is also provided in the constitution under article 243 where urban local bodies are empowered to create such committees in order to develop the particular area. Delhi slums rehabilitation policy is one of the best examples where the government of the Delhi has decided to develop the slum areas through in situ development. That is people will not be removed, will not be forced to rehabilitate. They will be removed temporarily and a new settlement will be developed by the government and the same population will be rehabilitated again on the same position. We require development in the proximity to the urban center and not 40 to 50 kilometers away from them because this will keep the economic activity intact and will keep these people employed throughout the year. Government should come up with the cost effective, comprehensive and long lasting development. The developmental activity in the slum area should be permanent. 
दे शुड रिक्वायर लीस्ट लेवल ऑफ इकोनॉमिक रीडेवलपमेंट और रिहेबिलिटेशन वी रिक्वायर फॉर्मल रिकॉग्निशन एंड एक्सपेंशन ऑफ वेलफेयर स्कीम्स फॉर द अर्बन पुअर गवर्नमेंट शुड लुक इन टू अ प्रपोजल वेयर दे कैन जनरेट एम जी नरेगा काइंड ऑफ अ स्कीम फॉर द अर्बन पुअर एज वेल वी रिक्वायर डेटा कलेक्शन इन ऑर्डर टू रिकोगनाइज द अर्बन पुअर टू द मैक्सिमम लेवल इन ऑर्डर टू अवेल ऑल द सर्विसेज टू दैम एंड लास्टली गवर्नमेंट शुड प्रोवाइड सेल्फ एम्प्लॉयमेंट इनिशिएटिव्स इन एंड अराउंड स्लम एरियाज इन ऑर्डर टू प्रोटेक्ट दीज पीपल फॉलोइंग इन टू द विशियस सर्कल ऑफ पॉवर्टी विद दिस डिस्कशन प्लेस लेट इज नाउ मूव टू द नेक्स्ट आर्टिकल फॉर द डे This article was published on page 14th of Delhi edition Hindu newspaper as the part of economic trend in India. The article says that India US trade has seen strong rebound that is bouncing back on its previous position or maybe close to that. According to the 2021 economic data, the US India trade or the bilateral trade has seen a rise. Even if we go by the last 20 years of economic data we can see that in 2001 the trade between both these nation was close to 20 billion dollars however in 2019 it rose to 145 billion dollars the relevance of this article comes from the fact that in prelim examination important trends of the indian economy could be asked however the data as such is not asked in the prelim examination UPSC can ask about the important increase or decrease in particular variable in the last 5 or 10 years. In the mains examination this information could be used as a potential point to be written in your answer. Well the best method to prepare for UPSC is to capture important information from various backgrounds. It is not that some articles are completely vague or useless. You can use these kind of instances to write a good answer in the mains examination. keeping this trend in mind we will look into the important economic trend in india's external sector and along with this we will also look into the composition and direction of india's trade both these things have been taken from the economic survey of this year but before that let us look into how important this article is all about in 2019 upsc has asked questions in the prelim examination about one of the largest exporter of rice in the world in last 5 years as i said they ask about the trend and not the important data the answer to this question was india very obvious india holds the largest exporter title as far as rice is concerned so let us start our analysis on the economic data of india's external sector so now let us understand how to utilize economic survey in this regard This diagram and many following diagrams have been taken from the economic survey of this year and from this diagram we will understand that how in depth study is required for the economic survey This diagram shows you the merchandise trade balance of India its export and imports when it is compared between 2018 to 2021 Now this diagram shows simply shows that in the past 3 years india's balance of trade has been in the negative phase as you can see all these are below zero so it means negative phase and the highest negative achievement was minus 49% and the lowest was minus 9.8% other than this is not required and why this minus 9.8% was there why we have so small trade deficit the reason was lockdown effect see they have already provided the answers in the economic survey why trade deficit was low in first quarter of 2020 because the demand of imports was very low when imports went low the trade deficit automatically reduced as you can see the imports were at almost minus 52 to 53% while exports were close to 39 to 40% in negative format this simply shows that there was a kind of low demand scenario and low consumption scenario which actually helped india's external sector apart from this nothing else is required from this table in the economic survey we can understand that what are those goods and services where india is having favorable terms of trade it means that which of these product and how much of them are actually benefiting india's trade the most important or the highest benefit which india actually occurs come from your pharmaceutical and biologicals apart from that we also benefit from different other products such as your petroleum products which always almost remains high and apart from this we also benefit from jewelry gold and related products 
So these three products actually help India to gain a favorable balance of trade. But when it comes to the unfavorable balance of trade, that is when we have balance of trade in negative phase, what are those goods which are responsible for this? Well, in this, the highest share goes to definitely your petroleum, that is the crude oil. So highest imports actually are from the crude oil. The second most notorious product is your gold, followed by coal, coke and other products. So these three are important and being notorious for your negative balance of trade. And lastly, we should see that India's merchandise trade balance with major countries. In this scenario, the best example is your US with which India has the highest trade surplus. On the other hand, China is the country where India has highest negative balance of trade. So in both this scenario, you can see that which countries are beneficial to India and which are not. Another important thing which you need to focus on this table is that exports to US has reduced, imports to the US has reduced. However, the trade balance has increased. On the other hand, when we talk about China, exports have increased, imports have reduced. And that is the reason trade deficit is low. And both these things are very, very good for Indian economy because the surplus is rising and the deficit is falling. And this is the trend in the last two years which we have observed. And you should keep this in mind while preparing for your prelims examination. And in similar manner, you should prepare many other tables which are given in the economic survey to prepare on the trend related questions. With this now, I'll leave you with the important question attached to this article. So read this question carefully and answer in the comment box. And now let us move to the next article for the day. Last article for today's discussion was published on page 11th of Delhi edition Hindu newspaper. This article tells us about the recent meeting which was conducted in order to go through the recommendation made by the Joshi committee and its report. This report is based on the committee which was headed by C.P. Joshi, the Speaker of Rajasthan Legislative Assembly. And this report was scrutinized by all the speakers who were present in the meeting. However, there was no consensus made on two issues. First, the limiting power of Speaker on anti-defection law under the 10th schedule. And the second point of discussion was that there should be no disruption policy towards the question hour and president or governor's address in the assembly. Both these issues could not be resolved as of now, but there is an optimistic environment that these kind of issues could be resolved in the future. The relevance of this article comes from both prelims as well as means as questions could be asked in the matter of anti-defection law, powers of the speaker, question hour and president or governor's address in the assembly. So today the content would include details on the question hour and president or governor's address. As far as anti-defection law and powers of the speakers are concerned, we have important references and detailed analysis which we have already conducted under the DNS. Now let us discuss about the question hour. This hour is the special time allocated towards the parliamentary proceeding or the legislative proceeding in the states. It is the first hour of every sitting of the parliament or the state legislation. The duration is one hour, that is, it is not extended beyond one hour. And member of parliament can ask questions to the ministers, that is, the executive. As you could recall that in the prelim examination also, this aspect was asked as the function or the important element of the parliamentary government. So when legislation asks questions to the executive, this is the basic crux of parliamentary system. And through these questions, they held accountable the executive for their functionings in their respective ministries. This question could also be asked to the private members, that is, member of parliament who are not ministers. It is regulated under the parliamentary rules, unlike the zero hour which is not mentioned in these rules. Zero hour starts at the 12 pm in the noon, hence it is known as zero hour and it is India's invention also. The presiding officers of both the houses, that is speaker in Lok Sabha and chairman in the Rajya Sabha, have the final authority with respect to the conduct of this question R, that is how it should be conducted, what kind of questions to be discussed, everything else. 
There are three kind of questions which are discussed under the question arc. First is the start question that is distinguished by the asterisk. It requires oral answer and supplementary questions could be followed. A star here simply means a kind of little warning to the person to whom these questions are going to be put up. After this star as an important note, the minister should be ready with alternate questions to be bombarded on him. The second is the unstart question which follow the opposite of the start one. They are written one and does not follow any other question. And third type is the short note questions that require a notice less than 10 days. So these are the three kind of questions which could be asked in the question R in every legislative sitting. Now let us look into the importance of president's address which is made in the parliament of India. And this address comes from the article 87 of the Indian constitution which talks about the special address given by the president. As far as state legislation is concerned, under the Indian constitution, article 176 provides similar power to the governor of the state in the state legislative assembly. According to this article, the first session of each general election of the house of the people, not Rajya Sabha, because Rajya Sabha is a permanent house, and commencement of the first session of each year, that is, five times a president is going to address the parliament in this manner. President shall address both houses of the parliament assembled together, not individually, and inform the parliament of the cause of its summon, that why the parliament has been called. The rules of this address is decided by the respective houses through their own procedures. Now, coming to the exemptions. Such an address is called the spatial address and it is also the annual feature. As I said, five years, five time. No other business is transacted till the president has addressed both the houses of the parliament assembled together. That is no bill could be passed, no questions could be asked, nothing can take place. There is one exemption. If at the time of the commencement of the first session of the year, let's say Lok Sabha is not in existence and has been dissolved. In that case, Rajya Sabha has to meet and Rajya Sabha can have its own session without the president's address. It simply means that whenever president addresses the parliament, both houses should be present. Single house will not be addressed at all. As you can see in this statement mentioned in the constitution itself, it says together. All right. So, apart from this, in case of the first session after each general election to the Lok Sabha, President addresses both houses of the parliament assembled together after the members have made and subscribed the oath or affirmation and the speaker has been elected. So, this is the basic requirement before the address of the president. Simply means a president can only address the member of parliament. So, in order to become a member of parliament, they have to subscribe to the oath and affirmation given in their respective houses. After they become the member of the parliament, president addresses them. In order to study more on how the anti-defection law defines the process in the parliament or the legislation, you can go through the Hindu analysis or the Daily News Simplified dated 9th of June 2021, for which we have already provided the link in the description box. If you want to read more on the role of the speaker, powers, limitations and controversies, you can go through the DNS dated 14th of September 2021, for which we have provided the link in the description box. With this, now we end up today's Daily News Simplified and I leave you with question of the day. Thank you.